In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the blessed month of Ba'una, and the church chose for us today the passage from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, that talks about the heavenly prayer or the Lord's prayer that starts with our Father who art in heaven. There are many articles and many sermons um, talking about our Father who art in heaven, the Lord's prayer. Today, I'd like to focus on the first sentence and the, and the prayer. When Christ taught his disciples to pray, he told them this, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. Usually the opening statement of any prayer is the most, carry the most important idea, even of a speech. Your first sentences carry the most important or the most relevant to what you want to say. So I want just to meditate a little bit about this sentence, our Father who art in heaven. God taught his disciple, or Christ taught his disciples to call him our Father, our Father, or to call God in heaven our Father. I'd like to take you back a little bit to the, the beginning of the story, take you back in time, how God created Adam and how God created everything. So you look the, in the book of Genesis, first chapter and second chapters, you'll see the creation of everything. God said, let it be light, there was light. Let it be water, there was water. Let it be earth, there was earth. Right? So by his word, he created the creation. But when he came to Adam, he did it differently. He didn't say a word. He actually made clay and breathed into that clay and created Adam. He didn't say a word to create Adam. That tells us that if you love someone, you have to put something to it. You have to put some work. Not just to tell them, I love you, وخلاص. منفعش. So God created Adam in a very specific way and also a very unique way. Nothing else in the whole creation was created this manner. Only Adam was created this way. It's as if he's telling him, I'm giving you something special because I will call you my son. I'll consider you my son. Keep that in mind, because this will help us understand why God left his glory in heaven and took body like ours and came and to save us. Because we hold a very special place in his heart. So, he created Adam and he planted a garden for him. Again, could have simply just said a word that the garden be there and it would be there. If you read Genesis second chapter and reread the creation of Adam and the place that God created for Adam to live in, you will see how much work God put in there, not just a word, but he actually, the Bible explains how he did it. Right? So he planted a garden for Adam. It's like when you, when you want to, uh, when you love your children so much and you want to um, leave them, I'll give them something special. Like you can go to the store and buy them a toy, right? That's easy. You can give them a gift card and ask them to buy what they like. Again, that's easy. But when you make their own toy or when you when you paint their own room, when you decorate their own room with your own hands for them, that tells how much love you have toward them. God did the same thing with Adam. He planted garden specifically for him. And this garden, Adam lived in the garden of Eden and he ate from it. So it was 
a shelter for Adam, his home where he lived, and it was food supply. But that was not it. God put Adam there and put him in the garden, and he entrusted him with the garden. If you read the book of Genesis chapter 2, you will see that God created Adam and told him, put him in the garden of Eden, uh, verse, uh, verse uh, 7 to 9. And he put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. So Adam had a job. Adam had a job. Was he a farmer? No, he was not a farmer. He was a gardener. There's a big difference. There's a big difference because after sin, Adam became a farmer. Not that I have anything against farmers, but I'm telling you that um, his first job, Adam's first job, was a gardener, to tend and to keep the garden. Did he have to work to eat? No, but he had a job. Meaning, Adam was not created without purpose. He was given something to do. Now, why I'm saying this? Why is it, why I'm stating this? Because it has applications to our lives. It's not healthy for the kids to spend the summer vacation without certain tasks, certain jobs, something to do. You don't delegate certain jobs to them or certain tasks to them. You don't put responsibilities on them, even if it's something very small. But trust them with something and delegate some tasks to them. It will give them something to do. It's very important, right? God created Adam and he trusted him with a garden to tend it and to keep it. So what is the difference between gardener and farmer? Did Adam have to irrigate the, the trees? I don't think so. I think rain used to come all the time, right? Point is, before fall or before sin, Adam just used to grab the fruits and eat and eat vegetables. That's his, he didn't have to do anything to eat. He was just taking care of the trees right, as a gardener, to make it look nice, to cut it, to groom it, right? But after sin, God told him, with the sweat of your forehead, you will eat your bread, because before that, he didn't have to sweat. It was easy. He just, all what he needed to just grab an apple, grab a mango or whatever, or a big watermelon, and just eat it, right? That was before fall. But after fall, now he had to tell the land he had to cultivate it, and he had to irrigate it, and wait for it. And, and after all this, it will sprout thorns to him, because that's the result of the sin. The, point, the applicable point to our life is that we need to trust our kids with certain tasks. I know that we started already the summer uh, vacations, or the holiday, whatever you guys call it, vacation, I think. But and we have three months, right, until maybe late August or something, make sure that you give your kids something to do during the vacation or the holiday. Don't just let them stay there and do nothing. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Teach them how to be responsible. The other point is when God put Adam to tend the Garden of Eden, he, that was the first commandment, by the way, if you read the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse nine, 7 to 9, he put it there to tend it and keep it. So he gave, them, he gave him a commandment. That was before even the commandment of eating of the tree. So he gave him rules on how to do things. When you give your kids certain tasks to do, you, I'm sure you can figure a thousand things that you can give to your kids. If they're old enough that they can hold dishes, and if you don't use your dishwasher that often, teach them how to wash dishes. Give them directions on how to do it. Encourage them, praise them, but also hold them accountable if they don't do the, get the job done. Again, that's responsibility. And in the meantime, teach them to obey. You give them rules and you teach them to obey. Obedience is crucial in life. Obedience is crucial in life. Most, um, most people who, was, who were not taught how to obey rules, they became very either 
not successful in their lives or they became criminals because they, they're not used to follow rules. They're against the rules. Teach them obedience to be successful and to be good citizens and to be good Christians too because this is our purpose. But before we teach them how to obey, we need to do something very valuable to them. God created Adam and used to talk to him all the time, spend time with him. So before you give them orders or rules to follow, make sure you spend time with them. Because the word, I, I think I, uh, I said this before, but it's, it's, it touched me so hard that, that it cannot go away. The word love is spelled T-I-M-E. Did you hear that before? The word love is spelled T-I-M-E. You love me, you spend time with me. Okay? You cannot just say, I love you, without doing anything. Then the word love doesn't have any meaning. Right? So the word love means, or is spelled T-I-M-E. means spend time with your kids, and when you work on that relationship with them, I assure you, they will listen to you. They will love spending time with you, and they will be... Um, Concerned not to make you mad or not to upset you because they like you, they love you, they want to spend time with you, so they care about your own feelings. And this is what we call personal relationship. God had that relationship with Adam. He loved him. He loved him that he put himself for him. Another part of the gospel that I want to um, look at or I find it relevant to the, to the message today that our Father who art in heaven is that um, the verse when he says, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will, be, and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. I'll say it again. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We ask all the time and nothing happens, God, right? But if we go back to the, the Greek, the original uh, language of the, of the gospel, and we read this in the original language in Greek, the tense is different. The tense of the, of the sentence is different. It's actually continuous tense in the original languages. Means that, and you will see this if you read it in English in the New Living Translation, you will see that they actually got the right tense correct. They say that God, Christ told them, keep asking and it will be given. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking and it will be open to you. Because when we hear it ask, so I did ask, I did it once. But the original tense is continuous, to keep asking. And it will be given to you. Keep asking and it will be given to you. When we do this, Sometimes we ask, but we don't seek. We ask, but we don't seek. When we ask for something in our prayers, we seek it. Prayers and works. Prayers and works, right? Now, I have a very um, interesting saying by uh, Jennifer Leclerc. She's a Christian writing. She says, a faith without work is dead, if faith without work is dead, then asking without seeking or knocking is just as lifeless. You have faith, but you don't apply your faith to your life, your faith is dead. If you ask, but you don't seek, your prayers is dead, because you don't do anything. Like someone say, Lord, please help me in my test. Help me in my test. And keep praying about his exams, right? But he doesn't study. What is this? This is not going to be accepted. Because he's asking but not seeking. He's asking but not seeking. Now, keep in mind that every time we stand to say the heavenly prayer or the Lord's prayer, we start with our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, that means we have a relationship with Him. Revisit your relationship with Him and see. Revisit your relationship with your kids. Revisit your relationship with your parents and, and, and test it and see. 
how do you how do you take this relationship? Do you take it personally? Do you take it seriously? Or you just do it because you're responsible for your kids? Oh, I have to listen for, for my parents because they just told me to do so. It's not about that. You have to find love there. Because if we don't have love, then we don't have God. May God always give us the strength and the, and the, and the heart and the relationship, the personal relationship with him. Tom is glory forever and ever. Amen.